This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. A former Navajo Nation president and Arizona lawmaker is being remembered for his years of service and many contributions to his tribe. Albert Hale died Tuesday of complications from the coronavirus, according to the Navajo Nation. He was 70. Hale was the second person ever elected to serve as Navajo Nation president. He was elected in 1995, held the position until 1998 when he stepped down. Six years later, the Democrat was elected to the Arizona legislature representing a district that includes much of the reservation. He served in the state Senate from 2004 to 2011 and the House from 2011 to 2017. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez called Hale a great leader, a loving family man and my brother. Throughout his lifetime, he demonstrated his love and compassion for our people through his services and all his great contributions. He stood strong on many issues and left the world a better place than he found it. Health officials in British Columbia, Canada are apologizing to the New Hulk Nation after a doctor withdrew more than 200 COVID-19 vaccines meant for elders. After missteps, miscues, and an email from New Hulk Executive Director Wilma Mack, Dr. John Harding left rural Bella Coola under police escort with less than 100 doses administered. CBC reports that Dr. Harding has offered two differing accounts for his team's quick departure. Kristen Milton, New Hulk Exec Director of Health for the Nation, says they were shocked that the doctor referred to the vaccinations as a gift. Public health is not a gift, and all First Nations need to know that. It is something that is supposed to be provided to every human being. Director Milton says the nation hopes that Vancouver Coastal Health will reconsider its decision so the vaccination of New Hulk elders can continue. A proposal to allow the creation of four schools that would teach Ocheti Sekouan language and culture failed to pass the South Dakota Senate. The bill's failure to pass represents a setback for indigenous educators and parents. Many worked in recent years to start the schools aimed at addressing a disproportionate dropout rate among Native Americans. The bill faced opposition by groups representing school districts who say the new schools would drain funds from their districts. Sage Fast Dog, Lakota, an educator who teaches the curriculum on the Rosebud Reservation, says he will keep pushing to reshape education. A similar proposal passed unanimously in the Senate last year, but failed to clear the South Dakota House. It's no surprise the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting the wallets of Native people, but one organization is stepping up to help some artists with a little extra cash to help pay the bills. Caitlin Onaway Boisel has the story. For 15 years now, the Woodland Indian Arts in Wisconsin have been showing off and helping to sell Native American basketry, beadwork, and jewelry. Now, with the pandemic and no public shows, they are finding a different way to help Native American artists enrolled in a tribe in Wisconsin. They partnered with the Wisconsin Indian Education Association to create an emergency relief fund. It's always a need. I think it's, um, it's, it's always ongoing. Uh, the journey never ends. That journey started with an idea to help artists succeed, even in this pandemic. COVID relief packages, like in different areas, but you don't see it in art. You know, specifically Native people um, have been hit especially hard by COVID because of the fact that many of our reservations and communities are in remote locations. They're not in urban areas. Artisans are Native craftspeople and artisans depend largely on tourism. And through that tourism is how they generate a lot of their income throughout the years. And with uh, COVID, you know, they're there's just uh, really nobody's traveling. Um, there are no organized events. And so therefore these artists don't have a forum or a venue to share their artwork outside of um, online. The many grants will range from 250 to $500. And the artists are able to use that money for a number of things, such as food, rent, childcare, or even equipment to help transition to online sales. It's not a lot, but Thomas says they are also working on an online conference called Indigenous STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. The artists will have a chance to show their art at the conference for free. In Wisconsin, Caitlin Anawa Boisel, Indian Country Today.
And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahant. When we come back, we'll hear more about the possible return of Jim Thorpe's Olympic Whip medals. In July of 1912, Jim Thorpe, Sackin Fox, Potawatomi, won the decathlon and the pentathlon at the Summer Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden. Only a year later, Thorpe would be stripped of those medals for playing minor league baseball, something that many athletes did during that time to support their families. Though his medals would be later returned to his family, the man named Brightpath would never see his Olympic wins restored. However, with the vice president of the International Olympic Committee calling for Thorpe's wins to be restored, hope is rising. Nedra Darling, Prairie Band Potawatomi, co-founded Bright Path Strong, a movement created to amplify the authentic Native American voices and their stories. Nedra also serves as executive producer for the major motion picture film in development Bright Path, the story of Jim Thorpe. She joins us today. Welcome, Nedra. Hi, hi, everybody at Indian Country Today. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you for asking us on to talk about the world's greatest athlete. So where do we stand with this uh, international politics really going on? Well, we have, um, as you know, as you stated, we started Bright Path Strong to create the movement to restore Jim's standings from the 1912 uh, decathlon and pentathlon. And Jim was the first uh, American to win two gold medals. He was also, of course, the first Native American. But for our viewers out there, he was also not an American citizen at the time, you know, not to receive that until years later. So he won the pentathlon by tripling the score of his nearest competitor and surpassed the second place winner uh, in the decathlon by, I think it was 688 points. So we thought, you know, that basically um, we need to finish the job. You know, there was a Jim Thorpe Foundation in the um, 80s that, you know, did return the medals. And it was at that point I'm learning and looking at, back through some of their foundation records that they just didn't get the job done. And it wasn't the foundation's fault. It was the International Olympic Committee. And if you go to the records today, he is listed as the co-winner, even with those outstanding scores that he presented there to the world. So it is amazing. Um, we have written a letter, um, it was I think in September, um, si signatures were like, you know, um, Billy Mills, um, numerous, numerous tribal leaders across the country, uh, people that, you know, put their heart and soul in getting this back because it, it means so much to Indian country to restore these honors. So, uh, the letter was sent to the president of the IOC saying, we'd like to work this out, work with you. We've started the petition. You know, uh, we are very interested in getting this done. And uh, we actually never heard back from him. Um, he had one of his librarians send us a letter and um, which had some actual factual information that was incorrect. So um, we reached out, uh, Bob Wheeler, who wrote the book, Jim Thorpe, um, we call him kind of our Thorpeologist. He is an amazing man. And <laughs> knows a lot about after his uh, thousands and thousands of interviews about Jim Thorpe over the years. Um, he actually contacted Anita de France, who is the first female, first African-American uh, vice president of the IOC. And at first she was even a little hesitant of, well, gee, if there must've been a reason why they didn't do this. And so after all the evidence that we presented over a few months, um, she, kept, she got back with us and she said, you know, I'm actually a little embarrassed about this. <laughs> and, and so she, um, the more we worked with her to educate her and bring the evidence that was, um, you know, found by Bob Wheeler, um, his researching wife, uh, uh, Flo Rideon. I mean, it was, um, she finally got it. I mean, the rules had, uh, the, the story had been basically um, 
uh, I think it was over six months later, after he won, after Jim Thorpe won, uh, the International Olympic Committee took the medals away and removed his name from the record books at the request of the AAU. When it was reported in the newspaper that he had played summer baseball in the summer leagues, in those days, uh, only amateur athletes were allowed to compete in the Olympics. So, um, you know, there are many circumstances uh, that, you know, Jim was a Native American. He didn't know the rules of the Olympics. He was an orphan and dependent on Pop Warner, um, his Carlisle Indian School coach for guidance. Uh, Pop had sent Jim to play summer baseball um, and there was money exchanged, but that money that Jim received he didn't get to go spend it himself. It was sent to um, Carlisle as their out system program. And he was never allowed to defend himself ever. So there are all these things that um, happened. And, and we found also that not only did he not get an opportunity to defend himself, um, he, was, he was forced to sign a statement by um, Moses Friedman, who was the superintendent of the school at that time and Pop Warner, um, you know, that they drew up. And uh, basically, uh, how egregious is that, you know, back in the day, and when there was such a heroic effort on his part, uh, on many levels, many levels. And uh, basically, the AAU uh, reinstated Jim in 1973, after some of this evidence was noted, and cleared the way for the IOC to reinstate Jim. And, um, you know, they, um, the IOC has just refused to do this, you know, for over to reinstate him for over 70 years now. So um, one of the one of the I think one of the most amazing things is um, they kept saying that they in some of the documents, they kept saying they did not have um, records of that time that were um, the official um, regulations of the games in 1912. <laughs> so, you know, that's uh, awkward. So um, some of the researchers from the Jim Thorpe Foundation, the early one, um, they actually went in and they found this in, I think it was the Library of Congress, and it was the Olympic Games at Stockholm 1912 uh, program and general regulations. So for years, the IOC told the public there were no written rules for these games, and rule number 13 uh, stated an objection to the qualification of a competitor had to be made before the lapse of 30 days from the distribution of the prizes. So his disqualification took place over six months after the winning. So he won the two gold medals and um, the IOC basically broke their own rules. So um, at that time, I think they, uh, there was some maneuver by Jim's children and before the medals were given and uh, the IOC relented uh, some legal action, and they gave duplication, duplicated uh, medals to the family, but they still refused to um, list him as the champion for those events. Instead, he's still listed as the co-champion, though these scores are just amazing. I don't think, you know, it's just amazing. Nobody broke these records for years, years. Well, well and, and I think the word you used, embarrassment, is right, because the, all of the sports community pretty much views Jim Thorpe as the greatest athlete of the century, and to have him not be recognized by the International Olympic Committee just makes no sense. Absolutely, absolutely. I grew up um, <clears throat> with, with Jim, um, not personally, my father, um, you know, he's Potawatomi. A lot of us are related to Potawatomi, uh, in his Potawatomi side, he's a distant relative of mine. And I think it's um, the stories I heard, of course he died before I was born, uh, but my, older sisters and brother, no, my oldest sister and two sisters lived in, um, you know, after Jim left the sports world, um, went to MGM to work in uh, California during the depression uh, for MGM. Um, you know, my father and he had been friends and, you know, just played at different places together, really. So I heard of him as this person that was part of our family. And um, as I, would always talk to my dad as we were traveling back and forth to the reservation or over to Sac and Fox for powwow or ceremonies. And um, he would tell me about Jim and um, because we'd see all the relatives there. And, you know, it just always, as a young native person at that time, kind of athletic I was, um, to hear this story and to think, okay, 
that's just wrong. <laughs> it's just not right. And nobody could ever say with that. They, I think they said it by the looks. I think they said it without saying it many times of just let it go, Nedra, just let it go. And uh, when this opportunity came along, I cannot let it go. We, we as Indian people and as sports enthusiasts, you know, it's time for the truth to come out. And it is there. We have the facts. And hopefully with the um, support of Anita de France, um, you know, she is in this position. Um, she has asked them to take a look at this. And she, in the editorial in the Washington Post, I think that's what you're referring to, she asked for the other um, Olympic Committee, um, you know, her comrades to join with her and get this right wrong, the wrong right. <laughs> so she's she's very committed to this. Um, she herself was an Olympian on the uh, 1976 rowing team. She was the captain and she knows, I mean, she's of um, African-American descent. She has a little bit of Creek, she says, a descent somewhere. Uh, and she's also European, you know, she's, she's a little bit mixed and she, she knows, she knows um, this type of treatment and uh, she's had it her life and, and she just um, feels as herself being um, part of the higher of the executive committee of the International Olympic Committee that um, she feels she has to get this done. And I believe she will. I believe she will. And I'm very proud to know her and very proud to work with her at this point. She's a great person. Well, we only have about a minute left, but I want to ask you kind of a broad question. One of the things that really strikes me about this is that having that medals be an asterisk is really a metaphor for Indian country being an asterisk nation, not in polls, not in everything else. And it really sets the tone for everything. It does. It does. Um, it, it does. It means it means everything. And, you know, when we started the when I you know started with the movie, as the executive producer of what, a year and a half, what, about a year and a half ago, I kept telling the people that I was meeting with, I said, you know, this is bigger than a movie. This is huge for Indian country. <laughs> and it is because through this movie, Indian country wins. We win for all of our ancestors. We win for the people that we've stood on their shoulders and we win for the right thing for this country. You know, he was proud to be there as an American athlete, even though he wasn't, even at that, that time, a citizen. So we have to do this. Nedra Darling, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Miigwech. We'll be back. Holly Cook Macaro has been a regular commentator for us and joins us again today. She's a uh, principal with uh, Spirit Rock Consulting and a member of the Red Lake Band uh, of Ojibwe Indians. Uh, Holly, welcome back to the show. And um, I want to ask you, what's going on in Washington? There's just so much. <laughs> Good morning, Mark. Thank you for having me. It, it has been um, a whirlwind of activity in Washington, DC. It, uh, this sudden return to normalcy um, I think while we've all been left with a little PTSD, this sudden return to normalcy with, with regular briefings, information being sent out, and some significant, several significant um, appointments for Indian country, um, executive orders and executive memos that affect Indian country. And we are all watching very closely and supporting the process of Congresswoman Deb Holland's nomination. Uh, and her confirmation moving forward in the Senate. So I, I can start with any one of those um, well, in, in the direction you want to go. Sure, sure. Well, I'll start with Secretary Designate uh, Deb Holland. It, yeah, it's still very exciting, right? We, um, it, 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 you can see in the headlines that there is a flurry of activity in regards to confirmation. There were hearings last week, hearings this week. There are confirmation votes. They confirmed Mayorkas last night. 
gave him a little trouble, but um, he came through. Grand Home, I believe, is up today um, for a um, committee vote. And in the same committee, Energy and Natural Resources, that has jurisdiction over Deb Holland's nomination. So of breaking news last night were uh, the committee assignments, the Senate Democratic committee assignments, which we had all been watching. Senator Stabenow from Michigan is moving off the committee. She's been a terrific advocate for Indian country in that role. Um, and the new assignments on the committee are Mark Kelly from Arizona and John Hickenlooper from Colorado. So those two folks, Mark Kelly in particular, I think has done a significant amount of outreach to uh, not only the tribes in Arizona, but also been meeting, making an effort to meet with tribes nationally. So I expect we'll, we will have another strong voice on energy and natural resources. Also critically, those are, are two votes that um, on the democratic side that we won't have to worry about. There were some more conservative members in line um, for those slots that we were keeping a close eye on, particularly given um, that the chair of the committee, and today is, I will actually, I believe the, the official power changeover in the Senate will take over today. The power sharing agreement in the Senate was just announced this morning. It's been dragging on for a month, which meant because of the unique 50-50 split in the Senate, and usually the split in the Senate decides the number of seats each party has on a committee. So they had to come to an agreement. They, they hearkened back to the previous, I, I, I think it was 2002, I, I don't recall exactly, um, when we had a 50-50 split. So at the committee level, if it is a tie vote, the nominee will advance, I understand. But if there is a tie vote on the floor of the House, then Vice President Kamala Harris will have to cast that deciding vote. So there had been some expectation that we would see Congresswoman Holland's uh, nomination hearing um, next week. Uh, but next week is also the beginning of the impeachment trial. So uh, they have looked to moving her hearing towards the end of the month or even towards the beginning of March. So that timeline has, has slipped a bit. Senator Holland, I understand, continues to uh, do her meetings with the member, the, the members of the committee, which is uh, the way things work. Um, she will go through, meet with members of the committee, hear their concerns, get an idea. It's both relationship building and an exchange of information in both directions. They get a feel for Congresswoman, Congresswoman Holland's positions and policy and uh, she gets a feel for what their approach will be during the hearing. Critically, there have been some key uh, executive orders and policy decisions coming out of the administration, even before uh, Congresswoman Holland is seated as at, at the Department of Interior. So while those, those decisions can't be attributed to her, she will have to answer and defend the administration's policy and positions at the hearing. So I uh, encourage Indian country to be on the lookout as we near that hearing date to, again, I think amp up our public support. And uh, there have been a number of tribal leaders, tribal organizations that are sending in those letters of support to the committee. And at this point, those are very critical. And it seems from afar that kind of the extractive industries is zeroing in on um, Congresswoman Holland as being kind of representative of all the change that's coming. Yes, absolutely. Even more so than I would say, uh, you know, Jennifer Granholm, who I, I would say has an equal um, starring role on the climate change panel of nominees in the Biden-Harris administration. But she had a very low key nomination hearing and the vote today, which is what we hope for with for, for Deb Holland. Um, no fanfare, no surprises, uh, support from all corners. Um, I, I will be curious to see how the vote falls today in the committee. Um, whether it's a, if, if we pick up a couple of Republicans, terrific. But if we don't, fine, we've got the majority, we can move forward. So the extraction industry is absolutely focusing on the nomination of Deb Holland. We saw a letter from Congressman Pete Stauber of Northern Minnesota, uh, that might be two, within the last 14, 16 days, 
and asking for the withdrawal of her nomination because of her positions and then her, her supporting role in supporting the Biden climate positions. And the, the tribes in, in, the, in Minnesota and the region pushed back immediately, which I thought was a terrific warning shot to the rest of the industry and the country that she has a solid base of support. Uh, these decisions and Congressman Stauber very much need to um, be in consultation with the tribes. So that development, and I, I, I think Congresswoman Holland is arming herself um, in preparation for the hearing appropriately as well. We will definitely have you back and we'll leave it there for today. Thank you, Holly Cook Makaro. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Miigwech. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition. I'm Mark Trahan. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.